These are good days for those of us who enjoy solitaire war games about air operations in World War II. And I know this seems incredibly specific, but yes, we have had a couple of very excellent games that fit the description recently. And also, you know, since the classic game B-17 came out a long time ago, in fact, this kind of game has really, has really become a subgenre within wargaming. And again, in the last year or so, we have had Skies Above the Reich, Above the Reich by GMT, we have had Target for Today by Legion, and now we have Night Fighter Ace by Compass Games. And this again fits the description I told you before. You are playing the game by yourself, you represent a character in the situation here, you are in fact a German pilot in World War II, and your job is to intercept Allied bombers and possibly try to dodge the the escorts. So you're trying to intercept Allied bombers and you're trying to shoot down as many as possible before they deliver their load of death and destruction over your country. So it's a solitary game, you control a pilot, or you say you are the pilot, but also like in other games of this type, you also have control over, over the crew. And like many games of this style, starting from B-17, this is a strongly narrative game. It is almost like a biography generator. It is not just that you play a game and you see the action, but you really get to know your pilot, to develop your pilot, to develop your characters. There are some ideas that seem to be borrowed from, uh, from role-playing games, uh, in a certain way, when you acquire skills, it's almost like you're leveling up. But those are, the, those are those these are all good things. These are good things because they add the narrative depth and they add the thematic interest to the to the story, to the adventure. So, without further ado, let me show you how Night Fighter Ace represents its theme, what the main mechanics of the game are, and also how it fits in the tradition of games that started with B17 and that has had so many successful examples in the last couple of months. The game is played in a sequence of sorties, and you will keep track of those by using these sortie log sheets. The game comes with a really good number of them, also they are double-sided. They go from August 43 until July 44. For each sortie you will record the target of the raid, of course of your enemies, uh, the status of the moon that will affect visibility, the aircrafts that you will encounter and that you will try to shoot down and kill as a result of the sortie and other notes. Now, you will repeat this until either you uh, survive until July 44, in which case then you tally your final score, or until you as the pilot, you play the role of the pilot, die, and in which case the game is over a little earlier, there was a time where I died the first, I swear, the first sortie. The pilot, me, was wounded and then I crashed the, the, the aircraft as I landed. So that was a very short and anticlimactic game. I hope you do better. But still, but still, even if you die during the war, you still get to count points and see how you did. Now, some things that we use in the game. Here you have a player aid to represent the pilot and crew status. You will place markers here to indicate, for example, the skills that your men get to acquire as they level up, as they gain points that they can spend during the game precisely to acquire these skills. You could use optional ace cards to give more personality to, well, to yourself, a more defined historical personality to the pilot that you are representing. And then again, areas for other markers such as your rank for example. Then we have the operations map with a sequence of play and where you keep track of information such as the weather, uh, the face of the moon and also the range at which uh, combat is occurring. Combat can be a long, medium or, or short range or to say and or because if you start attacking a long range then you're still approaching as you attack and so actually you will attack three times one at each range. If you start at short then well that's the only attack you do unless then you do a maneuver to try to pass next to the target again. Then we have the mat that represents your aircraft. Um, I set up one with a 
token with a counter that represent your emmet, other things here such as the base uh, the, where you start and the group that you belong to. And each of these mats uh, has an area with technical information such as maybe uh, the electronics that they have, the weapon systems, some have infinite ammo for game purposes and some you need to keep track of our expenditure by using tokens, uh, like in that case. And then here we have an area for the crew status and an area for the amount of damage that you can take. Damage will be directed to specific areas of the aircraft and you will use damage markers to record uh, the, not just how much damage you get but also where and if a damage reaches an X here for example in this case the port wing has been destroyed well if the damage reaches one of the axes that's that's bad that's bad your aircraft is shut down so but speaking of these mats that represent the aircraft I want to tell you that there are a lot you really get a chance of flying a lot of different models with this game you said a stack of player aids here these are all different these are all different aircraft uh, different models that will uh, fly in different ways the air that you see here indicates uh, pretty much where they go to fly their missions and how long it takes them to go there but they're just very different from one another some are more resistant uh, structurally to certain amounts of damage some have more or less electronics different weapons again different areas in which they fly and we'll talk about that later and as if the stack was not enough well they're double-sided so really a ton of different models totally impressive now also we have a bomber target mat which is where what we use to keep track of the damage that we inflict on them when you encounter an enemy you will determine the model of the enemy that you encounter so for example if we have intercepted a halifax or a b17 we use this diagram here to keep track of the damage that they are taking and again same as above we're trying to get damage not just spreading it all around which is cute but doesn't do all that much rather we're trying to concentrate damage until we get them pretty much uh, to fail uh, to fail in one of the vital elements of the aircraft and for example and the p17 it takes a little more to destroy it and this is why you have axes that are uh, that are lower than or for example the lancaster is very strong in airframe has an extra point of resistance in airframe but the general idea is when you encounter an x boom you shoot it down and oh, if we've counted the Wellington, then we use with that the diagram here and the same for the types of model. So really neat thing. Now, like in other classic games, of World War II air combat, uh, and probably you're thinking of B-17, that's a very accurate comparison, you will roll dice on a lot of different tables and that is really what creates the story, but not nearly, not nearly as many tables as say in B-17 or in B-29. In fact, these are pretty much the tables that you will need to use, which seem a lot, but again, compared to some of the historical precedents, not many at all. Heck, recently I played a game in which I have a whole book full of tables or charts. Now, what happens is you determine, you determine the aircraft that you will be flying, and then for each sortie, it, you need to determine first thing the target of the of the raid that you're trying to intercept. So you roll, uh, you roll two d sixes, and you check the column corresponding um, corresponding to the time, to the period in which you're fighting, and then you'll know where the target is. Suppose, for example, that the target is in Berlin. Actually, you know what? Let's say that the target of the raid is Frankfurt for reasons that you will understand. After we know the target, we go to the takeoff area of our base. In this case, uh, during setup, that was the base assigned to me. And so my missions will take place on this track here on the endurance track if my base was in berlin then each sortia will be using this one going from takeoff to landing then 
we need to roll uh, to determine the weather, which of course will affect certain things, such as, for example, my ability to land without dying. Then we check the moon, and that is based on the calendar that is represented, that is, remember, is represented here, which again will affect visibility and will, for example, affect the possibility of intercepting the enemies. Finally, we also, as we're taking off, roll dice for random electronic failure, and there is, I think you guessed it, a table for that, so bad stuff may happen in case you have an electronics failure. It may also be that uh, the part, the electronic part that the table tells you uh, that is failing is not really on your model, in which case you treat that as no effect. But there's always a chance that something will not work in the more complex your aircraft, the more things may go wrong with it. That makes perfect sense to me. Finally, or finally I should say, the main mission starts when you move directly, you jump from your place where you were, to the uh, location of the raid. It is assumed that as you were trying to intercept uh, the raid, uh, nothing happened, I guess that's the idea. Which is also why on this track here, uh, well, if Berlin is the if Berlin is the target, then after we take off, we go directly here. And basically each turn, each, each box in which we are, we check to see if there's an interception. If there is one, we resolve it, then we move to the next box, check for an interception, and so on and so forth until we land, and then we perform the landing procedure and we hope that we survive. So it is entirely possible, in fact, to have a very short mission if the raid is going towards Berlin, then you intercept them pretty much at the end of your journey and there's only a chance for one interception. There is even the possibility that uh, as you're traveling, there you discover is a spoof raid, in which case you will simply skip boxes because you wasted time going after a raid that was just a distraction. But this is the general idea. Go to the place of the raid, check for an interception, resolve that, move to the next box, check for an interception. Again, from time to time you have to move further because of various events and continue until landing or until dead. Now, how do we check for interception? Well, there is a table for that, would you believe it? Now, we roll on this table here, on the interception table, we roll a d10 this time, and we apply modifiers that may have to do with the technology, may have to do with the visibility that night, and we see if there is, if you're unsure of a location, which means that actually, um, we treat as no, well, it's always in short location, means no contest in the box, and the next, which means we skip a, a box, again, just because we got lost a little bit, and so we skip another box here in the endurance track. Or also you may get a lot of targets, or hoo -hoo, good old school interception. Now, when you have an interception, you roll to determine what you intercepted. And there is... There are tables for that. Roll on the table corresponding to the period in which the mission is occurring. And now we know which section of that player aid that we saw earlier represents the aircraft that we have intercepted and that we're trying to shoot down and that we're trying to assign damage markers to. Suppose, oh, we encounter a Lancaster. Now, we compare the speed of the of the target, in this case, Alan Castle would be 14 with ours. If ours is slower, then we can catch up to them. We are faster than them, so that's all good. We can actually attack them. And here, we really zoom in. Up to this point, really, the player doesn't have a lot of choices. You're pretty much in for the ride, but then you're zooming in and things become tactical and you have to make a couple of decisions. You need to choose if you want to use your forward weapons, if you want to use your scratch music. I don't think that's how it's pronounced, but that's my best rendition of this thing here, because I don't speak German. Which is, which is simply weapons that would be mounted on top of your aircraft and that you would use when you're flying right under the, your, your target. Which is very sneaky, they don't have ways of firing back at you because they don't have, um, they don't have guns mounted on their belly. So it's very sneaky, it's very powerful. On the other hand, it may be that then the debris, as you destroy the target which is right over you, the debris will fall 
on you. And there's a slightly different procedure for that. Uh, the standard attack, let's say the standard attack is the forward attack. Also, when you attack with a forward attack, you can decide if you want to do a normal burst or a long burst, extended burst, much more fireful as you can imagine, but also at risk of jamming, jamming the, gun, the guns or blinding your pilot. So right there you have several decisions. Another important decision, which I already mentioned briefly, is you need to decide when the attack starts. You are getting closer and closer, but pretty much the attack starts not as you're approaching, but when you start firing. So if you start uh, the attack a long distance, basically the attack will last three turns or three combat rounds. One at long distance, medium and short. So, hooray, more chances of firing, but then the opponent will also start doing evasive maneuvers, so you'll miss the chance of launching a really powerful, nasty attack up close. Also, depending on the range, the number of hits that you and the opponent and the target are exchanging will change. Or you can choose pretty much to start only at a short, a short distance, so you just sneak next to them, you attack only then. It's a very powerful attack and they don't have time to start core screwing to, uh, to try to avoid your hits. After, pretty much after an attack a short distance, whether it is the third, the second or the only attack that you did in that pass, you can decide to break contact. You may be forced to break contact by a game effect or you may choose to push to the objective and then you roll a die to see if you're able in fact to turn around and still catch up to them and perform another attack. Now, all of those attacks, uh, medium, long and short distance, they have different modifiers but they are resolved in the same way, which is by drawing a card from the combat deck. The cards will tell you simply the number of hits that you inflict on the opponent uh, based on the firepower that you have, and this will be modified by the range, short, medium or long. Contact, if this is the first attack of that pass, or that uh, of that, well, the first time that you're attacking that attack, you check to see if you have been spotted or not. If you're spotted, if you're not spotted, you fire first, and then next round of combat in that uh, in that approach, you will actually fire simultaneously. That is, the opponent and you will fire simultaneously, but there are a good chance that you get to fire first, the first round. Also, other things, when does the bomber begin to score you, which will inflict a penalty to the number of hits that you inflict. So here, various game functions, the hits that you inflict, and here the automatic hits that the opponent inflicts, they don't roll against you, there will be modified based on certain things, again, based on distance, but the randomizing factor is already in the fact that you're drawing the card, you don't need to roll further. I like that, it's very simple, very, very intuitive. So what happens pretty much is when I made those decisions about the weapons, how much I'm firing, and when I'm starting, I simply, the first contact, draw the card, and again, I check to see if I'm first to fire, hooray, if I'm first to fire, and next round, the opponent will get a reduction in damage. Now I check how much firepower I'm producing with my weapon, suppose that I am shooting with this weapon here, and that produces four fire powers and with the forward cannon and I'm spending a point on ammo to do so then I have a fire power of 10. For power of 10 is more than 8, not quite 12, so I'll use 8 instead. I'm inflicting one hit on the opponent. Again, that may be modified by a myriad of factors, then I roll on a table to determine where I hit them. Actually, another important thing, before you, uh, before you resolve combat, you decide also where you want to hit. Are you trying to attack the, the gun or the opponent, or, a, or their airframe, or a wing? So, if you are successful for each hit, you will roll on a table to determine exactly where you hit. Also, some of those results are letters, uh, for example, GP means that actually you're able to hit exactly the point that you are aiming at, in other cases you hit stuff around it, or you may still get lucky and hit that one, but it's not automatic, you need to roll. Or with a DE, the uh, target is destroyed immediately, sometimes you get a really lucky break and just the whole card is pretty much a DE, a destruction. So, 
it may be the airplane destroyed in one lucky hit uh, the target otherwise uh, you will roll on tables to determine where exactly where exactly you will place those damage markers that you saw earlier and then alas it was fun while well, you were firing but now the opponent fires and you receive hits and you will roll on a table but this time to determine which parts of your aircraft get damaged and you re and you may remember where your record damage we use this thing here we use also this area, area here in case systems get damaged or the crew gets wounded but this is pretty much and very simple the general idea uh, there is one thing that i want to mention because i like this very much in most uh, games of this kind you shoot down the air the, the enemy well that's a kill you don't shoot them down it's assumed that no matter how many hits you're like one point for destroying them and if you don't destroy them during combat, it's assumed that they will live forever. But that's unfair because I may still go down into a ball of fire as I try to land. Why shouldn't they? And this is the beauty of it. In fact, you may break contact even if you did not shoot down the enemy, but you inflicted a lot of damage. You still get to roll a die, apply modifiers. For example, you get a positive modifier for each system that you almost destroy, where you're just one from destroying the aircraft. So you roll a die, and there's still a chance that the aircraft that you targeted will be destroyed on their way home. So it just adds not just more excitement, but also more thematic depth, because it doesn't look like the enemies are just um, jumping into and out of existence. They just disappear into nothingness at the end of the encounter. Even they have their little story. Even they have other things that may happen after after the encounter with your crew and with your aircraft. So continue like this, sortie after sortie, you gain experience uh, that you can spend to acquire skills and you continue like this until, well, the end of the game, which may be at the end of the log sheet, July 44, or when you die at the point, you count points based on the number of kills that you were able to achieve and that will tell you, that will, that will determine your level of victory or defeat. So we are lucky, as I said in the introduction, we have had a lot of excellent games that fit the description of solitaire war games about World War II, about the skies of World War II, and Night Fighter Ace is another excellent game in that family, in that category. I had a really good time playing it. And even after playing Target for Today or Skies Above the Reich, and of course I played B-17 and some other games of this type in the past, I didn't feel any sense of like, oh, I've had enough of this. No, if there are more games of this kind, bring them in, I'll play them all. Because I really enjoyed this game, because it had that family resemblance with those other games that I like, so that is great. So I find I found in Night Fighter Ace the same things that I like in B-17, in, um, in Target for Today, which is the story, which is, again, the thematic depth, which is the uncertainty, which is the excitement, which is sometimes the disappointment, the anticlimactic element of going out there and there's a mission in which nothing happens. And then all of a sudden you have another mission in which the, the apocalypse uh, happens, um, which is very different from other styles of games. Eurogamers, I guess, would freak out about this because you really cannot predict what's going to happen. But people that like history, people that like war gaming, well, we're acquainted to that. Actually, we enjoy something that may have a very discontinuous, very unpredictable pace, may have moments of of, st of stasis and then moments of crazy excitement may have completely crazy situations which in fact you lose the game in the first mission that happened to me um, so that uncertainty if you like history if you like war gaming is something that actually you get to cherish when you find in games because then they give you the flavor they give you the sense of how the events in, in fact actually played out uh, so there is that. Uh, so I enjoyed, again, that sense of history, the sense of theme that, uh, that I found here in Night Fighter Ace and that I'm familiar with from, from other games of the same family. At the same time, Night Fighter Ace did not feel like just a rehashing of old ideas, just a derivative new installment in this family. Uh, there are games that came out recently that are more similar to, to the antecedents. For example, Target for Today, which I like, is very, 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 
very, did they say it's very similar to B17. It is a, a revamped version. Again, it's very, very, very good. But you still see that it's very similar. Night Fighter Ace, uh, to me, is more similar to Skies About the Reich in the sense of being more innovative, more different from, from its original roots. Think about it, that in the traditional B-17 and uh, Target for Today you have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of different uh, tables that you need to consult. Here the system is much more economic, you have fewer tables, so you have a much leaner um, system of rules. In fact, well, the manual is fairly long, but then when you don't consider setup instructions, that's not really stuff that, oh my gosh, I had to study that. And then there are other procedures, especially after landing, debriefing, that you don't really need to know all that much when you start playing the game. So when I look at the actual pages with the rules that I need to know to play the game, I think it's like between four and six of the core engine of the game is extremely lean. So you have just a few pages of rules, you have not many tables, and if anything you're worried like, but how can this game generate the kind of variety, the kind of unpredictability that I expect from an historical game about this topic? Well, I don't know how it does it, but it does, and that is the magic of the design. Actually, this is a game, in fact, that has, among the games that they mentioned, a really considerable level of tactical variety. Um, tactically speaking, it's more interesting than B-17 or Target for today. You just have more decisions at the moment of the encounter, when it's there, when it's time to really... Uh, to fight, to fight, to fight the encounter. You have been looking, you have been going around the night, uh, and many times nothing happens, finally the target is there, and then you have a lot of interesting decisions. You can choose when you're going, when you're going to start shooting, so technically when the attack starts, the distance, the position, uh, the weapons that you're going to use, other things that I didn't mention, but there are just more things that you can do here than, than I find, for example, in B-17, which is exciting as you're going along uh, the flow of events and you're following the story, but here you feel more in control, you feel that there is more agency, more different things that you can do, you have more of a sense of like a real fight going on, and that detail of the fact that uh, your target may still go down after the confrontation, after the confrontation uh, is over, after your contact is over. To me, that's a huge thing, actually. It seems small, but it's not just that, well, it gives me ways of getting more kills. It makes the world of the story larger. It doesn't make the confrontation that I have with the enemy appear like in a bubble that fluctuates into the void. It really gives me the sense that that confrontation is part of a larger world that in a sense keeps existing even when I'm not looking. So just in terms of world building, that little detail has to me uh, important, important ripple effects. But in general, just this game gives me um, the pleasure of the story of the narrative that I know from B-17 or from Target for today with more tactical um, depth. And But how does this game stack up against um, Skies Above the Reich? That also is a game with enormous tactical depth. And I would say with more tactical depth than this one even, but at the same time, Skies of the Reich is a tough nut to crack. It is very, it's pretty intense, it's really intense, it is procedures, mechanics heavy. Uh, it is definitely something for season war gamers. As opposed to Night Fighter Ace, definitely is a war game that I would recommend to beginner war games. I know viewers on my videos are always looking for what should I play if I'm just starting or I want to introduce somebody uh, to this, this side of the hobby. This is a game that a newer gamer and a spyware gamer can definitely enjoy. It has definitely fewer rules and procedures than a lot of other war games out there and yet it still packs up a lot of story, a lot of uh, theme and a lot of interesting decisions, again with this particularly detailed, particularly exciting, particularly um, three-dimensional representation of combat that it has. So. Um, 
Night Fighter Ace, definitely a game that I enjoy very much, a game that I, recommend, I would recommend to newer gamers, but also to season war gamers, because definitely there is a lot to like in this game in this game here. If you like history, if you like solitaire games, if you like playable narratives, then well, no matter which of these groups you belong to or multiple ones, Night Fighter Ace may be for you. Personally, I enjoyed this game very much and I believe that there are a lot of other players out there that will.